Some people want it. I think when people don't record it, they, they can feel like they're, they can talk about whoever they want and it's a, they, they get a little more open. Uh, but I appreciate you letting us record it. Erica Kahn, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us tonight. And uh, thank you for, so much for letting us share, uh, letting us watch this movie. As you can see, we've got about 65 people here today. So it's a nice big, uh, nice big crowd out in the world. And, um, and, uh, um, and they're going to they're gonna come and uh, they're going to ask you some questions. Uh, I'm a reminder that you're going to tell them who, who you are, what your name is, and, uh, and what year in school you are, whatever. So she get, gets an idea who she's talking to. Uh, again, thank you so much. I love this film. It's beautiful. I've got a couple of questions to ask, and then we'll turn it over to them. And I think the obvious question that you get asked, probably the first question you get asked with a film about this is finding your subject and getting access to your subject. And, um, and I think my follow-up question with that is, um, is uh, you know, I've seen two of your films now. I've seen this one and, and, and Football We Trust, uh, two very uh, different sort of immersive culturally films where we kind of really dive in to uh, a, a person's lifestyle and culture and family and and um, and and so how did you meet um, this judge and uh, end up making this film and and what are just some of your practices as far as as far as you know that immersion and that ability to sort of dive so deep into these these cultures Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I would love to see all of you. It feels like so many little empty boxes. So if you, if, um, thank you, seeing, seeing, you know, some more people turn their cameras on, would love to see you. Um, uh, I just want to say that's a rule. If you're asking a question, you're showing your face for sure. <laughs> but it's nice to see you, even if you're not asking a question. So excited to be a part of this, uh, to be a part of this um, discussion tonight. Um, I actually was on shooting hiatus with my first film in Football We Trust when I received a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship to teach film in Israel-Palestine. And I, when I went to the Middle East, I had absolutely no intention whatsoever of making another film. I had completely um, been absorbed within Football We Trust and um, we were having funding challenges. It seemed like the best time to go on, on hiatus. Um, and I had planned to, in addition to continuing some of my postgraduate research in Islamic feminism at Hebrew University and uh, the teaching fellowship, um, to do a lot of grant writing, which is central to independent filmmaking. Grant writing, treatment writing is maybe 75% of our job. It's um, uh, unfortunate to say that 75% of your job actually is, is um, about fundraising. So I ended up in the Middle East in um, Israel, Palestine. And one day a dear friend and colleague at Hebrew University invited me to this Islamic reform meeting that was happening at the Palestinian Authority um, conference room in Ramallah, which is essentially the capital of the West Bank. And I walked into this conference room, very aware that I was the only woman in this room, um, in addition to my colleague, and was seated at a table full of men in tarbushes, the judges um, that you've now seen in, in the film, and was very much kind of fascinated by the pictures and maps of Mandate Palestine and uh, Yasser Arafat throughout the years. And all of a sudden, Judge Khulud walked in. And she had this unbelievable presence that just really radiated throughout the room. And at this point, I didn't actually know that she was the first woman judge. So I listened to her speak throughout this meeting about how women are disproportionately impacted legally um, by, the, by the occupation and how difficult it is to create uniformity of law when Palestine is so divided. I mean, literally, when you think about how Gaza is under a completely different set of, of like a legal backdrop, a completely different set of laws from uh, Israel within the 1948 borders, with, then from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem to the West Bank. Like how, how is it even possible to create some sort of uniformity? It's not. Um, and women typically are the most, um, the most impacted by 
uh, by the severing of, of the legal framework in Palestine. So after, after the meeting, I had a chance to speak with her one-on-one -on -one, and I said, Judge Khulud, I've listened to you speak about the importance of raising the marriage age and polygamy and domestic violence. You know, tell me a little bit more about you. And she said, well, tell me about you. And I said, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I'm here, I'm actually studying Islamic feminism. She goes, come to my court. And I, you know, Judge Khulud is just this brilliant kind of, you know, always five steps ahead of you um, kind of person. So I walk into her courtroom. She's in the middle of adjudicating. And that day I watched her adjudicate somewhere around 40 cases. She adjudicates somewhere between 40 and 60 cases every day. And as you see in the film, she acts as part judge, part lawyer, part marital therapist. And at the end of the day, I said, wow, Judge Khulud, you know, your story, I think really has the potential to reach a lot of people. And the cases that you're seeing are not so dissimilar from the cases that we see in family courts in the United States. And I think that your story will also provide imagery of strong Muslim women, which we don't usually get to see, and also address the um, increasing global Islamophobia. And she said, you know, Erica, I've been waiting for someone to come along. And this was really the moment where it all, it all started, beginning of 2012. And from there, I mean, Judge Khulud and I became very close friends. She's actually come out a couple of times to the US and was at our premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival a couple of years ago. And although she welcomed us, you know, completely, wholeheartedly into her home, into her courtroom, into her family's lives, it was definitely a process of requesting access from the Chief Justice. As you see in the film, the Chief Justice, or Qadi al Quda changed three times in the making of this film. And each time we would have to go back and ask um, for access again to the courts. And each time it got harder. By the time um, it was with Dr. al Habash, you know, I essentially had to camp out of his office for days upon days upon days um, for him to finally agree to meeting with me. And um, thankfully we were able to continue um, to have access in, in that case as well. So, which brings up a, a question. So how long of a period did you film this? Because it feels like quite a while. It was shot over five years mm -hmm. and um, edited throughout the entire process. And uh, this is actually, you know, between between in football we trust and the judge. These were shorter shorter films than the film that I actually just released, Belly of the Beast, which was a ten year process. So it feels, in in hindsight, although it felt very long at the time, it actually feels like a, a shorter process than most. And you had moved over there to Palestine, and so you were there. Were you there that whole time, or were you going back and forth? I was there for seven months in 2012 and then went back for a couple of months every year periodically after that and worked with an incredible um, team on the ground uh, producing cinematography team to be able to shoot when I wasn't um, able to be there. Okay. All right. Well, I want, I have a dozen, you and I could sit here and talk for three hours, but yes, that's very unfair <laughs> for everybody else and they're, and they, and they need to, uh, they need to share their questions. So I'm just going to go through. So please, people, start putting your name down there. Uh, I think, Sydney, you wrote something way at the beginning, and I want to make sure that that was for a question. Sydney Sorensen? Yeah, so hi, I'm Sydney Sorensen. I'm a junior. Um, my question was mostly, I'm just curious about like the documentary process. Like, What made you decide to dedicate like that much time to each documentary that you're choosing because I looked into like the football we trust and that was like these kids throughout their entire high school experience so what about it made you want to just like dedicate this much time to each of these specific stories that's such a good question nice to meet you um you know I like to say that these films were not films that I sought out. They were films, they were stories that found me. And I know when I can't stop thinking about something, where literally I'm like playing possible story scenario after story scenario in my head, 
that it's something that I could live with for a long time. Um, but I just, it's just, it's, it's a subject matter that kind of grabs me by the throat and doesn't let go. So in the case of In Football We Trust, I was really, really inspired um, after meeting Harvey Longy for the first time and Leva and Vita Bloomfield and um, having grown up in Salt Lake City and um, watching kind of the, the uh, pipeline of Pacific Islanders into the NFL and also the misrepresentation of Pacific Islanders in the media. Um, I thought this was a really, was a really important um, film and also to kind of expose global sport capitalism from a character driven story perspective. Uh, with the judge, I mean, it was this happen chance meeting with her that all of a sudden it's like your life changes after some very serendipitous moment of, of meeting someone who is so beyond captivating. And I will say um, with, with Belly of the Beast, you're, you'll kind of see a pattern of, of addressing legal issues through film. Belly of the Beast is a, is a tenure um, project that exposes human rights abuses in women's prisons today, specifically the illegal sterilization of predominantly women of color in prisons today. And uh, that was another happen chance um, meeting with one of the main protagonists in uh, 2010 and actually um, became a volunteer legal advocate after um, meeting um, one of the main protagonists and um, decided that this, our, our prison system had um, so many heinous things happening um, that people weren't aware of and needed to be exposed. Perfect, thank you. Mute myself. All right, I think we have Zach Beckstrand. Um, hi, Erica, thank you so much uh, for this film. Um, my name is Zach, I'm a senior here. Um, I wanted to hear about maybe some of the most challenging parts of making this documentary. Um, yeah, what, what were some of those challenges that you faced? Thank you, Zach. There were a lot of challenges in the making of this film. I think um, when I first started this project, uh, people felt like this was a kind of a day in the life portrait of um, an individual and didn't necessarily see the story arc in the film. You know, when you shoot cinema verite films, you can only anticipate or hope that, um, that there will be a, some sort of story arc. Um, and obviously we had no idea when we started filming this project that there would be the murder in her courtroom or that her cases would be taken away. And um, I think in the beginning of this process, fundraising was tremendously challenging because people didn't see the story. I also think that, you know, eight years ago, our understanding of Palestine and Palestinian women and Palestinian rights in the United States was very different um, than what it is now. And because um, a, lot of, a lot of funders um, are interested in exploring um, thing, issues related to Palestine, that was a tremendous challenge. In terms of actual cinematography, kind of shooting production, one of the biggest challenges in shooting in the Sharia courts were one, the confinement of the space itself. I mean, the room was very small. And in order to film in these spaces, you're also um, participating in proper courtroom protocol. So every time that you that people stand up, I'm also standing up. Every time they're sitting down, I'm also sitting down. And there's not freedom of mobility within that room because you want to preserve the, you know, the actual court case and not be uh, obtrusive in any way. So shooting things um, were very complicated. We actually had a GoPro in one corner of the room more like hoping that something was going to be captured and hoping that the GoPro batteries didn't run out because there's nothing you can do. It's not like I can go over there and walk in the middle of a court case and swap out the batteries. And then, you know, imagine having a small DSLR essentially in your lap. I had it on a monopod, like literally like <laughs> in my lap, trying to be able to film certain things. And then we also had um, a Zoom recorder with a lot of um, 
uh, for Hulud and then also picking up some of the, the audio from the actual court case. And that's just the actual setup. Then when people came in to have their cases heard, it was a process of trying to really briefly describe what I was doing, what the film was about um, in a way that didn't hold up court proceedings. And a lot of times people weren't open to being filmed because these are incredibly intimate cases, intimate details about their lives. And so it became a, like a very quick conversation about, okay, are you comfortable with your voice being recorded? Do, would you want it altered? Would you prefer to be anonymous? Can I film your hands and feet? Um, and so that negotiation of, of what people felt comfortable with had to be done so quickly and also had to be done in, in Arabic, which is not my, my first language. Um, so when people said, yes, you can record, you know, my voice or you can record my, my likeness, but I don't want you to actually show my face, then the issue became, how do you recreate these moments? Um, and as you see in the film, there are a couple of recreations actually with Khulud at the center of them talking about some of the cases that were most profound for her. Um, so that was definitely a, a creative decision that came out of challenges um, regarding um, access. And then I think finally, I really wanted to portray Palestine um, in a way that invited people in, that really transported viewers into the experience of Palestinian culture. And that included you know, recording specific sounds of call to prayer in each different city, of the insects, of the bugs, of the honking, of the, the dust and kind of just ambient air in each, in each street. Um, so we spent a lot of, had a lot of attention to detail in terms of the soundscape and creating that environment. But I think most challenging was shooting Palestine with a drone. I mean, if you think about what happens with drones in occupied Palestine, you think about drones that the military have, observational drones. And if you um, were to put up a drone near a checkpoint, the IDF would shoot it down. So there's very specific, I mean, drones aren't allowed, period. Um, so there was very specific concerns that we had um, about, about shooting Palestine from an aerial perspective. So we put up, the only place we could really put up the drone was in the middle of Arab cities, villages, and we're very aware that people may come running out of their houses concerned about what kind of surveillance was going on. But instead, people came running out of their homes with cakes and coffee, um, saying thank you so much for showing the world Palestine that they don't have access to. Awesome, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thanks, Zach. The drone footage is great. Um, Thank you. Uh, and um, I was just going to say about one of the things that was really interesting to me where, you know, you don't do a lot of um, <clears throat> sort of like talking about the political situation in Palestine. There's a lot of just assumptions that this is Palestine. Take it in, enjoy it, and, you know, immerse yourself in it. But I love the, the references to checkpoints throughout the throughout the thing. It's very intriguing. All right, Mr. Uh, Wes, Wes Cyphers. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming in with us. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I got called into work, so I'm just chilling in the back room right now. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I watched the film earlier today, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I've always been interested with the conflict of, you know, Israel and Palestine, and this was such like a beautiful story um, that just kind of wraps everything together. And I think you did a super amazing job, you and your crew. And so, yeah, thank you for sharing this. But uh, my question to you um, is kind of already been answered, but I like. Uh, seeing how, even though this is on the other side of the world, these are still some of the struggles that we face here, you know, with uh, religious, I guess you could call it religious sponsored misogyny, uh, you know, things like that, where 
women really are not given a fair chance in this country. And it just goes to show that if, you know, the odds are stacked against you, you can still absolutely do it. And I think it's so amazing. Um, so my question for you is, uh, what kind of challenges did you face, you know, like as a, um, as a female filmmaker, especially in Palestine, you know, working with your crew, what kind of issues did you face kind of in that regard? Thank you for joining and thank you for your question. Um, I, I do think it was very important to kind of draw the parallels between what we see in the United States and, and what's going on in Palestine. It's actually not so, so different. I mean, the same questions that were asked and how people responded about having a woman as a, um, as a Sharia judge, that they're too emotional or that we're not ready for it. Those same conversations that were happening in Palestine were the same conversations that we were having during the Hillary Clinton campaign. And, and um, you know, you actually hear the reference to Hillary Clinton um, in, in the film as well by Khulud's father. So I think it's really, it was, it was important to me to, to um, bring audiences in and that it's not just a story about Palestine, it's not just a story about some other place in the world, that this is actually what's going on in our own backyard. Um, in terms of any experiences that I had as a as a woman um, in Palestine making this film, I mean, honestly, I think perhaps in this scenario, I was really underestimated by the chief justices. And I think perhaps if I had been um, a, a better known filmmaker, a male filmmaker, um, someone with a lot more equipment um, that I perhaps wouldn't have been given the access that I was given um, because the chief justices, I think, dramatically underestimated me. That's, a good That's so awesome. Thank you so much. That's awesome. All right, we have Mariah Kessler. Hi. <laughs> um, thanks. Again, for, for coming, um, my question, I'm going into editing. Um, I think I'm a senior, so. Um, uh, but I've been thinking about, um, since you were directing, how involved were you in the editing process and being able to um, put the, put different, you know, stories within the story together to make it a cohesive film? How, how involved were you in that? I am very involved in the edit and I'm also a music editor. So I'm very involved in the creation of the music and how music um, is, is introduced to the film and the process mm -hmm. of um, doing a temp score for the film and then ultimately scoring um, the film. I worked very closely with, with the composer, um, uh, Omar Fidel, who's the same composer for my other film, Belly of the Beast. And um, although I didn't do any of the editing myself on um, The Judge, I mean, I did some of the initial sample reels and kind of fundraising trailers. Um, yeah. I typically am, am more involved. I, I did a lot of the editing on my, um, on Belly of the Beast and uh, also some in Football We Trust. In terms of this editing process, it was very unique in that we edited throughout the entire process. I mean, after I shot the, all of, um, the first footage in 2012, once I was able to get um, funding to be able to start editing, I automatically began working with an editor on creating an assembly. And then every time I would go back and shoot, we would incorporate that footage. So by the time we got to the end, I knew exactly what needed to be recreated and what kind of setups and how much aerial footage and um, was really able to, to budget appropriately for um, everything that needed to be shot at the very end. So it was a pretty organized process as it went along, it sounds like, it was, which I feel like made it a lot easier to... It made it a lot easier in terms of the scope of filming and in terms of fundraising because we had such a limited budget. Um, right. Actually worked with two editors, Sarah Mamori and Ken Schneider on this project and at times they were both simultaneously editing. Okay, cool. And did they use, I assume they use the same program too? For yes, everything? for this we used Avid. Okay, cool. This is so exciting. Okay, 
Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mr. Will King. I didn't think I'd get a chance. Uh, hi, my name's Will. I'm in the screenwriting program uh, here at UVU. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, I, I really like the, like as other people have mentioned that you're able to get into to Palestinian culture and like to show us the world and get us to feel like it's not so, quite so foreign. Uh, you know, like we've got some, uh, some things that we can connect to just being, you know, a bunch of white kids from, uh, well, at least me being a white kid from Utah. Uh, I, I wanted to ask like, what, what is the process of getting to be able so that you can go into another culture and feel that uh, you're, you're ready, able to, pre to present this world in a fair uh, way, in uh, a way that shows it, uh, to, to the rest of the world and to make it so that you're the one that's the best able to tell this story uh, rather than saying, well, this is a great story to tell, but I think someone else should tell it. I think the question that you just asked, Will, is something that our industry is continuously grappling with. And in this moment, really trying to address who has the right to tell which story, what is the, what is the proper way to tell a story and in particular for the judge, it was, it was definitely a moment, first of all, I speak, I speak Arabic, not fluently, but um, conversationally, and um, studied and did a lot of postgraduate research in Islamic feminism. So I had had um, a background that um, was, that equipped me to, to have some of these initial conversations. Um, Obviously, every film is a learning experience, and I um, would never would never claim to be an expert um, in Islamic feminism or Sharia law, um, but was, did have a, an extensive background in it. And I also feel like Judge Khulud, in part, chose me to tell this story, and it was very much a collaboration with with Judge Khulud. Um, she was an incredible collaborator. I like to call um, Judge Khulud a film participant as opposed to a film subject because she was an active participant in the storytelling, um, an active participant in determining how her story would be told. And um, she saw a, a cut before the film was finished. She saw footage along the way. And also we had a, a very substantial Palestinian crew um, and I think that that was also important to being able to tell this story um, accurately and to do justice to, to her story. And I think that that is a very important component of, of storytelling and who has the right to tell which stories is that your crew should also represent um, the population and what you are telling a story about. Um, and we had a very strong advisory board of Islamic scholars, um, uh, women in the Middle East scholars, um, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic law, Palestinian law, um, Palestinian feminism, you know, the feminist movement in Palestine actually dramatically influenced Western feminism. So that was an important component of, of this film as well. So combining, uh, you know, your own knowledge with a very well-rounded team that um, is, is equipped to tell the story that you're telling, I think is, is key. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really good information. Uh, especially things just like the advisory board or things I had never even thought about. Do you mind if I ask how you went about gathering your advisory board? Sure. I, um, in the very early stages of a project with InfoBall We Trust, we had an advisory board. With Belly of the Beast, I had an advisory board. In the early beginnings of a project, especially the, the types of stories that I tell, I, I am not an expert in the history of global sport capitalism or Pacific Islander culture or Pacific Islander history or history in the Mormon church and football. Those are not my areas of expertise. And so I know that I need to surround myself with people who are way more knowledgeable than, than I could ever be um, and who can provide feedback along the way, like, hey, you know, this, is, this isn't accurate or you're misrepresenting this detail. Um, same with Islamic law, never a scholar in that. Uh, I can, there's so much to know. 
um, you know, history of the Middle East, history of colonialism, history of, you know, how the legal framework was, um, was fragmented post-Ottoman Empire, um, experts on Israel-Palestine, um, experts in Islamic feminism. That was very important um, for me. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you, you answering questions today and for making the movie and for uh, showing it to us. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's been eye-opening eye for me and I really hope that someday I can make something that's uh, even close to what you've accomplished. Thank you, Well, <laughs> Connor Hunt. Sorry, just pulling it up right here. Um, hi. Sorry, I'm, I'm Connor, I'm a senior and I'm an editor. Uh, so uh, kind of piggybacking off of Mariah's question about editing as well, you said you were editing on a day-to-day -day process with the footage that you were having and editing as you were going along. How much extra footage did you guys have that I guess you didn't want to exclude from the story, but you had in there extra just to help tell the story or in special features or something like that, if that question makes sense. <laughs> yes, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Connor. Um, I think with the judge, I'll, I'll tell you, well, in football we trust, it was 500 hours. There was so much footage we didn't use. Um, that was a very painful editing process. <laughs> with the judge, we didn't have a lot of extra footage. Everything was very intentionally shot given how, um, how difficult, um, you know, traveling back and forth to Palestine is and um, the limited amount of time that I could be there. We had a couple of scenes in the, in the rough cuts that I really miss. And one of those scenes um, was when Judge Khaloud and her best friend Esmahan, who was the second judge to be appointed, we're sitting in Esmahan's living room talking about how Sharia law needs to modernize, to incorporate DNA evidence, to deal with online dating. And that conversation I felt just really helped contextualize the moment that we were, you know, that we're all in and how law needs to be reformed and adapted to the times that we're in. And ultimately, um, that's not kind of the direction that the film went in, but it's a scene that I still miss. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, great film, by the way. Loved it a lot. So I appreciate your hard work on that. Thanks, Connor. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Um, <clears throat> Connor Hunt, followed by Tanner Padbury. Hey, great flick. Had a lot of fun watching it. Good stuff. Um, Erica, like when said, I'm Tanner, and I have some questions. Um, about storytelling from um, your documentary perspective. Um, I know that uh, with documentary filmmaking, um, part of it is you, you have your subject that interests you and then you kind of have to find your story. Um, and I guess I'm <laughs> kind of a broad question. I, I'm curious how you do that, how you did that. I'm I was, uh, I was and am making a documentary film about my friend who's a through hiker. He hikes from Mexico to Canada, um, you know, in a manner of six months. And, you know, he's a really interesting guy and it's an interesting thing he's doing, but I don't know, like how you create that arc, how you, how you find the story. It really, it, it seems like a big risk to me to go in and, you know, shoot all this stuff. And I, like, what if I don't have anything by the end of it? And of course, I have to be thinking about it all, but I'm curious what process you went through while doing that. Thank you for that question. It's, it's so tough when you're shooting a cinema verite documentary to know exactly how it'll turn out. And it's a process that I am consistently reevaluating. Where is the story going? What needs to happen? How do I structure this? Is there enough something here that everyone else will want to watch? Or is this just my personal 
passion, my personal interest? How do I relate this to a larger audience who doesn't have the background in the subject matter, who isn't friends with the person that I'm shooting? You know, how do I bring people in? So before I start filming, I come up with an ideal scenario, the best prediction of what this film could be. So I imagine all the possible scenarios. What is the time frame that I'll be filming this? Of course, it never ends up being exactly the time frame that you anticipated. But you start with something. You know, within Football We Trust, it was we are going to film four people throughout their senior year of high school as they make their way from college football into or from high school football into college football, ultimately with, with the dream of making it to the NFL. One year, this is like what's going to happen. We structured it around football games. We structured around what potentially could happen. And then I wrote this treatment of, you know, act one, the film opens, you know, we're in Harvey Longy's household. We, you know, we're getting to know his family. We understand da, 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 da. And, um, kind of create, if, as if I were writing a fiction film, what might happen? And then I pursue that. So you already know when you start a film, you know enough about your film participants, if you're shooting something cinema verite, you know what they like to do in their daily life. You can kind of anticipate, okay, they're gonna have a family dinner, they're going to have a sports game, they're going to be talking to their partner, they're going to be you know, going dancing, whatever it is, you already know. So you start creating those scenes and start, you know, in an ideal world, how would that scene be captured? Do you really want to focus on people's feet because you don't have permission to shoot everyone's faces? Do you need to come up with a totally different style because this shoot would require six cameras and that's not the, within your budget? You know, you're constantly reassessing, reevaluating, and then yes, a significant part of the story does get created in the edit. But that direction from the very beginning is so key to understanding the possibility of where the film might be able to go. I could talk about this for a long time, Tanner. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if it, um, cause I, I, I know oh, there are a lot of other questions too. I, I, I appreciate that. That was a good, that was a good, uh, good answer. It's got me more than it answered my question. It's got me thinking about you know what I would like to do, which is much better, I think. So thank you so much. All right, uh, Chesney Barra. Yes, okay, one second, I gotta turn the video. Okay, sorry. So I'm a freshman. Well, yeah, technically a freshman. I transferred school, so I started school all over again. But my question is, what was the first thing you did when you realized you wanted to do this film? Like when you realized you wanted to do a story? What was the first thing you did and like what were the first steps in general for any film or like you do like what are the first few steps to get ready for this like big project. I write down my initial feelings about a subject matter when I have them because keep in mind these are films that I live with for years. These films outlast relationships. These films outlast like other little jobs. These films become your life. Um, so I write down my initial feelings. What is my, what is my gut reaction to the subject matter? How do I see this? How in an ideal world would this come to be? What was my, what was my initial spark? How did I see this person? How do I see this subject matter? And then I start pitching, just really soft pitching. You know, I was in the process of grant writing with In Football We Trust and had a call um, with the U Utah Humanities Council. Um, and they were uh, a funder on the, um, uh, In Football We Trust. I actually found out when I was over there that they were giving us one of our first seed grants, $5,000 grant. And I said, oh, you know, I'm over here, just curious, you know, how this resonates with you. And I talked to them about it. Had applied to um, ITBS, a, a funding arm of PBS for independent filmmakers. And we didn't um, get that round of funding on In Football We Trust. But while they were giving me feedback, I said, do you, mind, do you mind just a couple minutes if I tell you about this other project? Would love to hear your thoughts on it. And I start understanding people's reactions talk to friends, talk to family members. 
how are they reacting to how I'm talking about it? And then I start revising how I talk about it and how I see the project because ultimately it's not just within my own world. It's, it's a film that I want to resonate with other people. Thank you, that really, I like that idea. Just like writing your thoughts down is very important and a good way to start. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who know, I think Jenny in her documentary two classes goes into deep about a lot of these funding sources and grant writing sources and stuff like that. I don't think Jenny McKenzie, are you here? I don't think she's here. But anyway, so anyway, you know Jenny, right? Of course, don't you? Yes. Excellent. So Alana has a question. I don't know who Alana is. There she is. I, I was, um, I'm Alana, I'm a freshman. I was wondering, like, what, what are the steps that you go through when you're filming in Palestine, like, a completely different country, and, like, what are the different kind of uh, passes you have to get through, and, like, visas and passports, and um, what's the, like, and how, what's it like with the language barrier and stuff like that? Um, because, um, we were shooting in occupied Palestine, there are checkpoints everywhere. Um, we never knew fully if we were going to be able to make it to a shoot on time or someone's house on time and had to budget enough, um, enough room for that to happen. It's very hard to make finalized plans. You can say, you know, Monday we're shooting this, Tuesday we're shooting this, Wednesday we're shooting five interviews but have to be fully prepared for that not to happen. And also, I mean, the roads are segregated and uh, me as an American, um, I could have been on different roads than our Palestinian crew, which is so, which is so um, heinous and disturbing. Um, and it was important for our crew to always travel together in solidarity. Um, in terms of the language barrier, um, at the beginning, I didn't have funding for a cinematographer. I didn't have funding for a translator. Um, so it was uh, me shooting and doing sound and um, conducting the interviews, which uh, was very challenging. And for example, when I was interviewing Sheikh Taysir Tamimi the first time, I said, you know, are you married? And um, he said that he had, he had two wives and I didn't know if he had actually said that he had been married twice or if he had two wives because the word in Arabic for marriage and married is um, like spouse is very, is very similar. So I had to stop and ask him for clarification. Like, did you mean that you've been married and divorced or do you have two wives? And then I later found out that he actually had three wives. Um, so, you know, little, little subtleties like that were, were hard in the beginning because my, I'm, I'm not fluent. And so it was such a, such a pleasure to be able to have funding to hire uh, a translator and a cin cinematographer, so I could really just focus on directing. And and what about your editors for the language? Um, one of our editors was fluent in Arabic, um, and the other editor didn't focus so much on um, on grammatical um, editing, so to speak. Um, in Avid, there's a script sync. So he was able to kind of click on where, you know, what the translation was and then um, kind of piece it together that way. All right. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Alana. And uh, Grace Rom. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm Grace. I'm a senior editor. Um, and I really, really like this film. It was, it was, like super awesome, super powerful. And um, my question is relating to this story about the woman who was um, stabbed by her husband in the court. And like, how did you, um, like in the editing process, when you were putting this together, where did you decide to, like your decisions about where to put this in the film? Cause it's a very, very like powerful piece. And I think where you placed it is is wonderful, but I'm just like wondering on your, on your thought process with that. Yeah, that was um, a very significant moment in Hulud's life. Um, and actually the moment that it happened, we weren't there and it was so hard for Hulud to talk about. 
um, in the moment that we chose to talk about it as just as friends and then to go back later and have her recount the details of what happened because it was too painful in the moment. Um, it was really, the, the murder in the courtroom was the catalyst for um, so many things to happen with Sheikh Youssef, the investigation, her cases being taken away, um, that it really felt kind of like the moment end of the second act um, that uh, ultimately did get resolved um, as we see in the third act. So in terms of placement, um, it, was, it was never something that was actually moved around in the edit at all. It was always in the place that it is now. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Okay, um, now em, uh, Emily Pratt, sorry, Emily Pratt. Hi, sorry, you can't see me, it's kind of dark in here, but um, my question is about, uh, sorry, I'm Emily, I'm a senior, I'm a writer, and my question is about the film, The Judge. I know sometimes filming in a different country can be dangerous, especially with a controversial topic, and I know you talked about the drones being shot down and just about the murder in the court, but was there ever a time filming when um, the crew found themselves in a dangerous situation and like how'd they get out of it? Um, there was never a moment where any of our crew felt like they were endangered um, and none of the drones were actually shot down. We knew that if we shot near a, a checkpoint or near the wall um, that there was potential for it to be shot down. So we avoided that scenario. I think the most challenging um, situation that we ever had was in, um, tra in traveling in and out of Palestine, you know, going through the checkpoints and we were very concerned that our footage would be confiscated. Um, I think going going into Palestine, one of the last times uh, um, my cinematographer and co-producer and I went through um, went through Jordan, and we were interrogated for many hours. Um, thankfully, we were able to get in, and um, that ended up resolving. But the footage was something that we were always concerned about, so we split up hard drives. Um, you know, different people took different. Um, uh, drives and we uploaded it online. Thank you. I really like the film. Thanks. All right. Um, now, let's see. People keep saying, oh, I have a question. And then they keep saying, oh, it got answered. Kelty, do you have a new question or are you good? <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Kelty. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for this film. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and yeah, my, my question was originally about um, how it was being a woman filmmaker in this culture, uh, but Wes had asked that already. Um, so I guess my question is more so like on your background. Like I know that you said that you um, have been really involved in um, Islamic feminism and all of that. And I was just wondering um, kind of like how you got into that, but then also into filmmaking and how it kind of all ties together, so. Sure. So I grew up in Salt Lake um, and uh, Sundance was in my backyard as it is for many of us and got involved with independent cinema very young. I um, was very fortunate to have a family that really valued uh, independent filmmaking. So started going to see Sundance films very young with my mom and we would um, go to Trolley Square and get the programs and circle all the films that we would want to see and um, then try and get tickets and I just loved the feeling of being transported into these different worlds and these different cultures and found myself just so so drawn into um, into the details of, of cinema and filmmaking and when I was 15, the Sundance Institute, actually in partnership with Spy Hop, I don't know if many of you have heard of Spy Hop, it's a youth media center in Salt Lake. And in their very, very first years of kind of being open, they um, had partnered with the Sundance Institute on um, empowering youth filmmakers to tell their own personal stories through documentary filmmaking. 
and having grown up in Salt Lake City as someone who wasn't LDS, um, who came from an interfaith family, you know, in a city where I felt faith defined who a person was, I kind of wanted to, to express the, the, you know, very teenage angsty time, sociocultural religious alienation that I was feeling and turn the camera on my family and kind of explore my, my grandparents' disappointment in my parents' intermarriage. So that for me was an incredible opportunity to, where I first really experienced the power of film. And that short film actually reached a lot of other um, young interfaith uh, kids across the nation and provided a lot of opportunities to have dialogue about um, interfaith families and um, interfaith dialogue. From there, I just became so committed to using film as a platform to discuss larger social issues and really as a catalyst for these deep kind of investigative conversations that need to happen in our society. And um, also very committed to providing this platform that I was so privileged to have access to for other people whose stories needed to be told and to tell that in collaboration with them. In terms of Islamic feminism, I mean, feminism, through kind of a religious lens, having grown up here in Utah was always very interesting to me, who was being left out of stories, who was being left out of history, um, how religious texts were created. And of course, in this time, I think it's very important to, to kind of flip the narrative on um, the Islamophobia and the history of Islam and really center the voices of, of women who were central um, to the beginning of, of Islam. So that's where, that's kind of where that, that started. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Spencer Brook had a question that said he didn't anymore. Do you have a new one, Spencer? How are you holding up, Erica? We've got a few more questions if you can take it. Yes. Um, no, mine's been all answered, all about finding the story in the edit. Excellent. Okay, Brady, let's go with you. Okay, I was just wondering um, about the drone footage. What drone did you use and um, what inspired, you know, all that footage? Um, it was, uh, I don't even remember the name of the drone, um, but it's something that we could attach a, a GoPro to. We did not have any choice on what kind of drone we were using. It was um, the cinematographer, the aerial uh, cinematographer we were working with um, had access to one and that was kind of just like no questions were asked. That was what we were going with. And um, sorry, Brady, what was the second part of your question? Just kind of like, did you come up with that idea um, that you wanted to get the city and everything? I did. I did. I felt it was really important to, to invite people into Palestine in a way that perhaps they hadn't been exposed to previously. Typically, we see um, Palestine as a, as a place that's confined, as a place that is under occupation. Um, we don't see the beauty of, of life and the warmth of people and, um, and really that celebrates the Palestinian culture. And so I wanted to have an opportunity that one, you know, people could experience the, the beauty of Palestine um, while not shying away from the complexities and the, the challenges of being under occupation. Thank you. I think your cinematographer was awesome. Very That's beautiful. Great. Cool, thank you. And Jess Anderson. I think that's Jess Anderson. Jess, anyway. Yeah, it's me. Hey, Erica. <laughs> I'm Jess. Uh, I'm a senior going into editing. Um, you kind of touched on my questions a little bit. Uh, you mentioned funding was hard because people didn't really see the story arc. And that made me wonder, um, how much of the story did you have kind of plotted out beforehand versus how much came together in your day-to-day -day edits that you were talking about? I think when in my first proposals, I really addressed kind of um, Hulud's backstory and her rise to becoming um, the first woman judge. And that is now such a small part of the film, um, kind of her history as a lawyer um, representing survivors of domestic violence and kind of how she felt like the Sharia courts was really the, the place where she could best create change. 
Um, so a lot of my initial proposal was backstory, um, you know, uh, telling things as they were unfolding in real time. And um, uh, I, I think that there was a, a lot of resistance um, to having a strong Palestinian woman as a lead character um, in the United States. And that's um, a hard truth. Uh, that I think um, is is definitely changing. Um, but uh, we at that moment as as a society were used to seeing Palestinian women um, in a very specific light. And I think that this film really challenged that narrative um, and took a few years for people to, to uh, accept um, that this was a different narrative. Awesome, thank you. I'm sorry, I was trying, I was unmuted and then I muted myself. Okay, so just was our last official question here, but I've got two more to kind of close things up. First of all, there's a beautiful moment in the film, very powerful moment in the film where the court employee is talking about the uh, stabbed woman and says, this is where she died. And then you stay on him for a long time as he takes that moment in. I want to ask you just a little bit about the discipline it requires to remove yourself and to let some of those quiet moments happening while you're filming them. And if you can sort of address how you learn to do that. Even in fiction films, the best moments that you are able to capture is when the camera is hanging there awkwardly in silence. Um, and uh, I think that people either start getting very uncomfortable or that they start um, revealing kind of their true feelings about something. So that's, I, I love doing that. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, great thing for every student to know is just to shut up and let people be, and then you'll see some magical stuff. The final thing is just, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't, uh, I should have tried to get a hold of Belly and the Beast before, before this, I'm sorry I wasn't up to date. How can we watch it? It's actually playing in virtual cinema right now. Um, so if you go to bellyofthebeastfilm.com, um, there's a watch page where you can actually select the theater um, that you want to support. It's important to support our independent theaters during this challenging time. Um, and 20% of your ticket purchase goes to support a racial justice organization, prison abolition, or reproductive justice organization in the same city as um, the theater of your choosing. Wow. Cool. So it will also be on uh, PBS's Independent Lens in two weeks also. So if you don't get to catch it in a theater, you can see it on PBS on November 23rd. Well, thank you so much. I will definitely watch it. Uh, everyone uh, give like a round of applause <laughs> virtually, I guess, to, to Erica. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time and a real honor to have you. Thank you for having me. And, uh, All right, everyone, enjoy your evenings, and um, I'm glad you enjoyed the film. And before everyone leaves, I'm going to let Erica go. I want to make a quick announcement uh, to everybody else. So you can stick around if you want to, Erica. But hey, everyone, just for the just for all you sophomores out there, I know you're get, you're hearing it from a lot of different people, but don't forget that uh, letters for portfolio review are due November 15th. Uh, that's your that's your letter of intent. And uh, if you um, if you uh, if you're going to be finished, mostly finished with your uh, lower division classes by the end of spring semester, you should be doing that. You should get online to our website uvu.edu/dgn/cinema and uh, and uh, read all of, and then go to student resources and read all about portfolio review or just reach out to me if you have questions. All right, everyone, have a great night. We'll see you in a month for Concrete Kids. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions and for coming out, and I uh, really appreciate it.